Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. <clears throat> I heartily welcome you all here in this uh, beautiful Senate Hall um, uh, of the Academy Building of the University of Utrecht to attend the promotion ceremony of Dr. Vincent. Um, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Knapa. I'm an anesthesiologist emeritus and I have the privilege to chair this session as a deputy director. Um, Professor Grohlmann here on my left side is promoter, Professor Kramers here on my right side is promoter, and the other members of the committee, I will introduce them whenever they have the word. I must say, it is still difficult for me to getting used to this situation. What we usually see is a Senate hall full of people, hundreds of people attending such a ceremony. But due to the COVID-19 limitations, we are only allowed to have a few people. On the other hand, Utrecht University is doing its utmost to provide the technical support to make this a real ceremony, this promotion ceremony a real ceremony. And we will do our utmost because after a number of years hard working, it is a crown on the work of the candidate. Also, this is not going to be an exam. What we'd like to see is whether the candidate is able to conduct a scientific interview with members of this committee who are all experts and also very interested in the work of the candidate. Mr. Candidate, are you ready? Yes, you I am. are. Good. Well, then I hereby open the session. Mr. Doctoral Candidate, the Board of Conferral of Utrecht University has now grants you the opportunity to defend your thesis in public. And I invite, I invite the first opponent to speak, and the first opponent is Professor Robe. Professor Robe is Professor of Neurosurgery here in the University of Utrecht, and moreover, he is the Chair of the Evaluation Committee, which has approved your Thesis and Professor Robo will speak loud and clear in the microphone. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Director. Mr. Promovendus, uh, congratulations on this work and the uh, tremendous experience you've reached in this type of surgery. Impressive uh, to read as a surgeon. And of course, um, when there are many results, many patients who've been looked at, um, there are small questions that arise in reading the results. Um, I was interested by the uh, the outcome measures that you you decided to use for chapter two to five, actually with the uh, children. It's very interesting to see that the ABG uh, closure is actually under ten decibels in many patients with the techniques you've used. But how does it translate into hearing ad independency? How does it translate into cognitive development of those kids? Did you, did you study that? Do you aim to do that? Do you have parallel studies with the neuropsychologists in your uh, team to, to look at that? We, thank you for your question. Um, we don't have a psychologist in, in the group, but um, to answer your question, the most important thing is to take care or to take into account the opposite ear, because if you get a, better, a hearing improvement on one side, um, the uh, speech uh, intelligibility will be also depending on uh, stages of the other ear. So there is a, another way to uh, check the results postoperatively, is to compare uh, hearing threshold post-op to the other ear, uh, which could be, for example, the non-operated ear, and then you make a comparison between uh, the operated and the opposite ear, and it must be not that much difference between both sides. That would be of major importance. And also, if, if we talk about children, uh, well, I think the most important thing is the real life after surgery, the improvement at school, for example, and these kind of things, and in the family also. But it's not uh, with a psychologist, uh, cl clearly, but it's a clinical uh, follow-up of my patient. I have the chance to be able to follow most of my patients, in fact. And, and, and I understand that, and that's why I'm, I'm asking, actually, I would love to see those results, actually, in the publications. Besides the uh, the ABG yes. uh, closure and the that would be interesting, uh, and bone conduction, yeah. Um, a very small question about the uh, statistical methods that you've been using. Um, these are most of the time univariate analyses, which I understand. But um, if you take chapter two, three, four, five, actually you switch constantly for the same um, type of analysis and almost the same sample size between t-tests 
paired key test and Wilkinson rank test. One assumes that the distribution is actually a Gaussian curve, the other one does not. But these are basically the same population. So isn't that a little bit of cherry picking the, uh, the test? Maybe, but to be honest with you, I'm not really uh, very good in statistics. And um, uh, Inge Wegner, who is working with, with me in you know, most of the papers, was able to do this. And I was following her steps, I would say. So uh, more important than that. It may be useful to, to, to look into that in the future as well, but that's, that's a little, uh, very little point. Uh, I, I looked at, at chapter 8 as well, which is very interesting with the uh, uh, PORP versus, uh, um, versus uh, TORP. And, and um, this is a comparison between two techniques, but also two periods of time uh, with an overlap between those two. Uh, now. Uh, part of it is probably due to um, the, the improved results that you see with the TORP. And, and of course, I understand that the age of the, the patients is older in the more recent uh, series. The baseline uh, deficit is also worse in the newer series. So that really pleads for an improvement with the technique. But how can you make sure that this is not most of it, uh, or part of it, uh, just due to the learning curve as a surgeon. We all know that we get better, at least for a time, uh, in the techniques. Well, if it was related to the learning curve, then when I come back sometimes to, for, for, to the use of a port, uh, I would get even better results with port than the one I had in the past. And that's still not the case. I still have better results and then, with port. And, and if I may interrupt you, that's precisely... Um, one part of my question, there is an overlap. And that means that the indication is also somewhat biased, actually, because you still use PORP and TORP nowadays. And on which, on which criteria do you actually decide for one yeah, or the that's, other? Yeah, that's an important point, and it could be a bias. That's, that's true, because I moved to PORP. My results are clearly, clinically and statistically, significantly better with TORPs, and that was published before me. But that was I moved to the TORP, but also because I introduced new techniques, which, which I call mildest relocation and elastic bending. And this made a big difference. Uh, but I still use sometimes PORPs because if we have specifically a very narrow gap between the fascia nerve and the stapes, there is no way that we can use a TORP. So in that case, I use a PORP. The second point is when I have a, it's a detail, but it's important, when I have a very small uh, gap or distance between the malleus handle and the stapes full plate. I know by experience that if it's less than five millimeter, then I have to use a port. The torque will not will not work. I understand. Work. For the sake of time, I'm just and and it probably does not influence that much or the the, the results at the end of the day if that's based on that, but it could. Um, and then one last question, uh, if if I may, Mr. Director, very yes, small. Please. Yes, please. Um, I've read. In this book, about well, several thousands of patients actually accumulated, accumulated either in the results or in the discussion, pointing to previous works of you and your team. I'm still trying to find an ethical statement in the um, in the material methods about doing those experiments, and it comes very crucial actually in chapter nine, where this is actually a device uh, development. Um, where I don't see any trace of informed consent, and um, I'm trying to, to, to understand what kind of frame for the development. Do you, I suppose you know about the ideal frame of uh, uh, surgical innovation. How, how precisely do you try to, uh, to, to bring the patient into account and, and the fact that, that this is actually an experimental device? Yeah, that, that's important. We have a file that we give to the patient and they sign the file and I explain a few things in the file. And specifically the technique. I have a complete small book explaining the technique, explaining the beginning of the I mean, timing of the technique, how I do it, and I put my results also for the new patient uh, comparing my previous technique and my new technique. So they know everything before, and they have a um, uh, consent form, form consent, and they sign it. And they know that this is experimental, that this is a new device. That you're yeah, that was the beginning, but you know, when we start, it's already done by the company, which has already uh, been approved by the uh, national health system in France. So we are able to use it uh, without any problem with that. I could not use it if it was not fully approved by the French NHS. Okay. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Director. Thank you very much, Professor Robert, for your introduction. Well, Mr. Kennedy, this is the first opponent, and it's usually, specifically in the strange surroundings, the difficult one. But uh, you did quite well, and I'm sure that will give a lot of energy for the rest of the uh, opposition. Utrecht University is quite proud that two outstanding academic institutions have been so kind to send one of their experts to this, um, to this meeting. And the first one is Professor Lenartz. Professor Lenartz is Professor of Ear, Nose and Throat Surgery at Hanover Medical School. Most welcome, and the opposition is for you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. The President. Um, uh, Robert, congratulations on your thesis and uh, the outstanding uh, work you have done uh, in uh, children with uh, different types of um, uh, different types of uh, conductive hearing loss. Now, the, my question is: um, Would you uh, consider to use uh, different treatment options for these children? Uh, for instance, bone conduction uh, hearing aids or uh, acoustic implants, which are uh, available nowadays and uh, uh, which provide um, safe uh, uh, and very reliable um, procedure and also a predictable outcome instead of doing um, type of difficult uh, middle ear surgery. Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas, for your question. Well, I think it's clearly a case-by-case -case discussion. In front, when each time we are in front of a young patient with a family, usually, it needs to be on the discussion. First, do we have to do surgery or not? Is, is, is the children is happy with the hearing aid? Sometimes they have a hearing aid. And if, if everything is fine with a regular hearing aid, in that case, I, I, would not go, I would not go for surgery. I will leave it like this until the children will be able to make his own decision in the future. But it happens in many cases that the children does not accept the hearing aid at school, having problems in terms of relations, social relationship. Um, and in that case, we have to do something. And I always start proposing the surgery. Uh, of course, this will depend on the airborne gap, the bone conduction and everything. But let's say it's a, a, a clear case of uh, mixed hearing loss. In that case, I always start by uh, middle ear reconstructive surgery using passive uh, implant. And of course, sometimes it may happen that we can move to a bone uh, or a active implant, but mainly in case of failure of the uh, initial surgery. So I, I usually uh, prefer to do for surgery first. And just uh, uh, if I can do it, add uh, the question, uh, uh, where do you see the role of uh, these uh, other treatments. So, for, uh, can you just describe uh, uh, conditions um, or cases where you would say, well, this is a case to give a bone conduction device uh, like Baja or Ponto uh, or even uh, transcutaneous uh, like the bone bridge uh, or the Viper Sun Bridge? Uh, it's mainly related to the importance of the malformation, specifically with the facial nerve. I had to uh, um, abort surgery in few cases where we have this uh, facial nerve covering completely, for example, the other window. There's no possibility to approach the full plate. So in, in those cases, it's clear that we move to uh, uh, our possibility, including uh, bone uh, hearing aid. Yes, sure. Specifically okay. in these cases. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Lenars. A second outstanding university who has sent one of his ex uh, experts is the university, the Catholic University of Leuven, Louvain. And we welcome Professor Officiers. He is Professor of Ear, Nose and Throat Surgery and also Head of the Department of Audiology. Please go ahead, Professor Officiers. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to, to see you there, uh, Mr. Candidate. And I congratulate you, as my predecessors did, with your outstanding work. It's, it's the work of a, of a very experienced craftsman and the work of a lifetime. And uh, reading through your book, I could uh, remember an adage by Goethe, in der Beschränkung zeigt sie der Meister, in the limitation shows uh, the real craftsman himself. And, and uh, you work in 
specific field and you're a real master craftsman. Now my questions. First question, um, what is for you the role of preoperative imaging as a workup tool in all these categories that you describe in, in your work? As you know, Irvin, in France now, imaging is becoming mandatory for some years. So, uh, in fact, we have to do it. it. But if you ask me, if you ask a uh, personal view, um, uh, whatever, uh, what has been decided by law, um, the most important thing is that you have a very experienced radiologist. And uh, that's not always the case. Um, you'll probably work with the best one in the world for that kind of things with a very high level of imaging. And that makes a huge difference. Because I see patients coming with uh, always now CT scan, and in the majority, not the majority, but it, it, the vast number of cases where the CT scan does, doesn't show anything, including C, uh, toscarosis. Mm -hmm. And so even when we have a normal CT scan, this does not change my indication, and I go for surgery. So there are lots of imaging which, uh, unfortunately, are not really reliable. Uh, but it's clear. if. If I had to make my own decision, if I was free, I would decide to go for a CT scan, a mandatory CT scan for any children, of course, for, because we can suspect any, any kind of malformation. Uh, but now there's no discussion. We have to do it in all cases. So I, I agree. It really depends on, on the quality of, uh, of the imaging. And it's also machine connected. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's only the uh, multi-detector CT that is reimbursed in France. Uh, there's a newer CT, the cone beam CT. Well, newer, it, it, it's a better CT. Um, that gives much higher resolution, low radiation, etc. And my experience is that on these machines, on the results of these machines, if you have them available, you can, you can see a lot of things. Would you support the reimbursement of the Comim city in France for that reason? And then would you use it if, if, if it's paid for? Sure, absolutely sure. But uh, Irvin, maybe you can contact the Ministry of Health in France to make it better because it's difficult to have that in France now. I will, I will but do I my would support. Send me coordinates, I will do so. I have a second question for you, uh, a more technical question. Uh, reading through the results of your revision cases. Uh, I see that uh, in about 8-9% of your own revisions, meaning you did the first uh, the primary surgery yourself, uh, there is a perilymphatic fistula as a cause of, of the revision, uh, which, is, which is high to my mind uh, when I compare it to my own series or even when I compare it to a series you revised by other surgeons, where it is definitely a bit lower. How, how can you explain it, this? What, what is your opinion about that? Well, it's really interesting. If you look to my paper, I had this, I think it's something like eight or nine cases of perilymphatic fistula. And it, interestingly, they all came during the first or second year of experience with this technique, mm -hmm. with vein graft interposition. And uh, when I was able to revise myself, my own failures, which I think is very important because we learn from failures, I was able to identify the, the location of the fistula, which occurred all the time from the anterior pole of the other window. And I could see that the vein graft was not well stretched. So I could identify my cause of failure and my mistake. And since I identified that, I changed a little bit in the timing of stretching the vein graft following stapedotomy. And now I know that I have to take some time to correctly stretch specifically the anterior pole. And since now many, many years, I haven't seen any fistula not post -op, which Okay, is that, that's an important point. Thank yeah. you for that. Because uh, it's not, not really elucidated in, in the written paper as such, but it answers the question. Because as you know, I don't do vein interposition. And it's very rare for me to see in my own revision cases, uh, fistula. And so the uh, vein graft that is connected with this finding, but it should, as all techniques, you should use it in, in, the, in the right uh, way. A, a last question, Mr. President, is that possible? Yes, please go ahead, there's time enough. Oh, okay. Uh, one of the things I, I was looking at is the length of, of follow-up. 
um, I see there is a large variability of, of follow-up in, in your series. And would you care to, to elucidate on that or expand on that, why, why this is the case? Yes, it's because the cost clinic, as you know, is well known worldwide. Mm. And I have patients coming from everywhere in the world, including Australia, uh, North and South America, etc. So for some of them, of course, it's not so easy to follow them. Mm. And even in France, they all come from every part of France. And sometimes it's quite difficult to get them back after one year. So that's the major reason. I always ask them to come after three months. That's important for me to see them post-operative at least three months later. And then, of course, if they can come every year, that's really the best. And I try to do that, but it's, it's not so easy to get that. But that's the main reason why I think. Well, it's the one advantage to live in a small country like Belgium <laughs> that uh, uh, we have our, our patients at arm's reach. Uh, but this explains the reason, and uh, I, I suppose you would wish it to be otherwise, but it's a fact of life that uh, you can't reach all these patients uh, for a lifetime. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Officiers, for your <coughs> participation on this, um, this interview. Uh, it's quite obvious that you knew the last two opponents very well, and you addressed them by name. I would recommend to address the next opponents with highly learned opponents. Yes? yes? Good. And the next opponent is Professor De Boer. Professor De Boer is Professor of Ophthalmic Surgery here at Utrecht University. Professor De Boer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, dear candidate, first of all, I would like to congratulate you with this thesis and also are my congratulations for your promotorus. I think the topic of your thesis is very important. For young children, it's obvious that to be able to hear or to see that it's very important for their uh, social development. So for that, I think it is uh, very interesting from patients' perspective. But I also have some questions. And my questions will be about chapter two, about the stepodotomy. I hope I okay. pronounce it well. Uh, and in the introduction, you say that uh, with stepodotomy, you create an open access to the inner ear uh, to restore the sound transmission. And uh, I need some explanation about that. Uh, um, what is the role of bone conduction in stepodotomy? Is it important that it, there is bone uh, conduction or not? Yes, it is, of, it is of major importance because this will give me uh, the amount of hearing improvement that I can get postoperatively. For example, if we have, uh, let's say, 50 dB decibel uh, hearing loss, mm -hmm. but if we have a bone conduction at 10 dB loss, which is normal, then we can expect a complete recovery of the hearing. But if we have uh, preoperatively a uh, 50 d decibel hearing loss with a bone connection at uh, 40 dB, it's going to be very small improvement. So that could be contraindication for surgery sometimes or debatable, I would say. So the bone conduction must be present before you do the surgery? Yes. And is it also important that the bone conduction will improve? After surgery? It could be. It could it, it's, be. Called, it's called the overclosure. It has been described. It, we, so we have to take into account this point. This is why I, I always try to operate, even when we have a bone connection dropping down preoperatively, because we can have an improvement of bone connection postoperatively for, uh, for some decibel, yes. Okay. But when I look to the results, uh, to uh, figure three and also table two, there is no uh, significant uh, improvement of bone conduction. Yes, it's true, because in fact, the um, existence of overclosure is debatable. I think it's also related to the audiometrician, the way the hearing test has been made preoperatively. And uh, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not totally sure that the real overclosure does exist frequently. So this is why in my series, the bone connection threshold pre and post-op are more or less the same. The most important thing is, is to be sure that there is no post-operative uh, bone connection dropping down, going okay. to sensor on a hearing loss, which would be really bad. So when it's stable, it is sure. more <laughs> or less po positive? Yes. Okay. That makes uh, clear for me. Okay. Thank you. 
And uh, my next question is, um, like in ophthalmology, huh, we have two eyes, we have two ears, and we have patients with bilateral of their, uh, who are bilateral affected. And we always have the discussion, should we include one eye or one ear per patient? And um, in chapter two, you included also bilateral cases. And do you think that that might have affected your results, that it might be a bias mm -hmm. in the results? No, I don't think so, because I, I, I present my results case by case, I would say ear by ear. And it's not, I, I don't present a result in terms of both years operated, but it, if a patient has been operated both sides, then I would say I got two cases, even if it's this may, the same patient. Uh, I do not operate, of course, both years at the same time. We wait at least one year before. Yes, but a patient might have a special um, characteristics for um, uh, wound healing or uh, so. Um, could that? Not that kind of things, but of course, uh, again, we, we can come back to bone conduction. If we have on the first year the bone conduction dropping down, what, what we call sensory or hearing loss, then in that case, I would probably not go for surgery on the opposite ear. That's important to take care, to take into account the first year first. Okay. And did you uh, consider, um, I'm also not a statistician, but when I go to a statistician with my both eyes in one study, he says you must use a general estimation equation to correct for including both eyes. Did you consider no. a GEE analysis in your It might results? be interesting, but again, as I said, my, uh, 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 my position in statistics is not that good, so I, I'm always using a, the, the use of Inger, uh, help of Inger Wegner, Dr. Inger, Inger Wegner for that. So that might be interesting, but we didn't do it. Okay. Thank you. I have no uh, further questions. Do we have some spare questions? If please, go ahead. Okay, I have some spare questions. Um, uh, what, uh, is it possible for every ear surgeon to do a stepodotomy, or is, are there special skills needed? I think it's a, a question for any type of surgery. I would say that some people, as, as, you, as you know, ophthalmology is the same. Uh, ENT is a surgical, field, a surgical speciality, but also a medical speciality. And we all know that some of, some of us start the, 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 the otology or ENT, and they are not prepared to do this. We can see that. So it's, it's something that can make a decision on that, to, make, to be a, become a surgeon or not. And stapy surgery is uh, a specific field in the field of otology. And uh, again, probably not all the surgeons could do it. But I must say that with a, a good learning curve, with a, uh, some time of training, if you get the right way of doing it, I would say it's open to any good surgeon. Uh, it, it's possible, of course. It's not magic, I would say. No, I totally agree with you. We have the same in the eye. Eh? It's a small organ, but you cannot... The cornea surgeon is completely different from the retina surgeon, and you would not like to have your retina operated by a cornea surgeon. So yeah. I think that but with special training, it is uh, possible. Um, when you look to your results about this, the pedotomy and you compare them with the literature, are the results uh, comparable or are there differences? Well, if I compare that to my, to, in my paper uh, to the previous big series, I had the chance to have uh, statistically significantly slightly better results than the, the previously published paper. Uh, so, yes, I would say I got better results, but of course this is related to the fact that my series was made by only one surgeon, myself. Mm -hmm. It was not a mix of uh, different surgeons like we can see sometimes, so uh, uh, make me some bias or difference with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Then uh, thank you for thank your you. answers. Thank you very much, Professor <clears throat> Dupuy. Um, the next opponent will be Professor Blijs, here of Utrecht University. Professor Blijs is Professor of Clinical Anatomy, and he is uh, continuing the discussion, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Rector. Dear candidates, uh, like the previous opponents, I would like to start with uh, complimenting and congratulating you on your thesis. 
And my congratulations go out to your promoters as well. It is a very interesting, interesting and wonderful piece of work, which I've read with great pleasure. And you won't be surprised that I've read it uh, from an anatomical point of view, because your thesis contains many interesting anatomical, but also biological uh, topics. And I would like to start with the latter aspects, an embryological topic, and then I would like to go with you to your introductory chapter, because on page 10, you make a statement, you say, well, a congenital partial bony plate, still present in the tympanic membrane, might be considered as the embryological demarcation between major and minor anomalies. And I don't understand this Exactly, because it reads a bit as if under normal circumstances uh, a bony plate develops in the tympanic membrane, or let's say the, the mesoderm, which forms part of the tympanic membrane, as a kind of predecessor. So could you explain this uh, statement further? Uh, not really. It's, we try to use a kind of adjectives maybe to differentiate um, really difficult congenital malformation. Uh, compared to a more easy one. I would say that when we have this um, uh, bony plate underlying the tympanic membrane, this is making a kind of second type of tympanic membrane underneath, which is really very strong. On the second hand, the uh, external or D3 canal is very narrow in most of the cases, and I do always trans-canal approach. And I have to elevate the tympanic membrane, I have to dissect the tympanic membrane to preserve it, and then trying to drill out this uh, bony plate to give uh, enough room for the ossicles and to leave uh, the ossicle free. So it's more a kind of, uh, it's not exactly what we call major anomalies and minor anomalies. I fully agree. Major anomalies would be with uh, uh, anomalies of the external ear and things like that. I fully agree with this. That was kind of uh, differentiation between really difficult one, like this, I said. <coughs> I understand. So it means it's a kind of clinical demarcation exactly. that you use. Okay, that, that's clear to me then. Mm -hmm. Then um, chapter four really attracted my interest, especially because you're discussing anomalies of the facial nerve and also aberrant causes of the facial nerve, which are connected, related to um, anomalies of the windows. And in your series of patients, you encounter an aberrant cause or another anomaly, including even divisions of the facial nerve uh, in, the, in the wall of the tympanic cavity in about 50%. I was wondering if these aberrant causes have consequences for the function of the nerve, especially thinking, of course, of the nerve supply of the facial muscles. I, fortunately, I never had any facial palsy post-operative in all these cases, mm -hmm. and also including for stapy surgery. Uh, so it's really depending on the way we use the surgical technique for that and the tools that we are using. Uh, I'm using a laser. I think it, it makes a huge difference. I'm using a laser with a handheld probe, which means that it's not a micro manipulator where you shoot it from the microscope. But with the handheld probe, you can touch the target and you can really be very precise and uh, we can avoid the facial nerve. So I never had any facial problems post up. I see. And may I infer from this answer that also preoperatively there are no problems with the, with the facial nerve function. So there is an aberrant course which you perhaps might see in advance by imaging or just encounter during surgery, but without any preoperative um, uh, malfunctioning. No, not okay. really. But we, we use the facial monitoring in this case when we do surgery, of course. And how about side branches? Because there, there is some problem with, with the, the normal um, topographical relationships. We have the greater petrosal nerve, uh, the gorda tympani. Do they show any malfunctioning, considering production of tears, uh, saliva, uh, taste? Gorda tympani is a problem. Even when we preserve it, um, there's no rule with this. Even when we perfectly preserve the gorda tympani without any, any, even touching it, we may have sometimes post-operative taste disturbance, that's the main point. And sometimes because of anatomical condition can be overstretched or cut and the patient sometimes do not complain. So it's very strange. 
But yes, we have, and I must say we have a certain amount of taste disturbance whilst operatively, which in the vast majority of cases will disappear with time. But that's the only thing I have, taste disturbance. Okay, thank you. Then, uh, very interestingly, you make a statement about possible cause of this, this, this anomaly, and you say, well, it is somehow widely seen that it's uh, due to a displacement of the facial nerve uh, during development in the second pharyngeal arch, because, well, of course, we know the facial nerve is the nerve of the second arch, and because of displacement, we'll have, uh, 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 let's say, a sequence of events which leads to this, um, let's say, syndrome. Um, is there anything known by you or perhaps in literature by the, the cause of this displacement? Or is it just uh, chance or how, how should we see this? I don't think so. I, never, I didn't see it. Hmm. No. no. So just something that happens. And, yeah. um, well, there are of course more structures which are derived from the second arch, uh, also bony structures like the styloid process, like the greater part of the hyoid bone. Have you seen anomalies of these structures in these patients? I don't remember it, having, having seen that. It's interesting is that in very specific cases where I have this uh, abnormal root of the facial nerve running over the promontory, in many of these cases, I would say even sometimes, I, don't, I, don't, I cannot say 100%, but in the vast majority of cases, I could see also the malformation of both the superstructure of the stapes, which was not attached to the stapes full plate, mm -hmm. and uh, having a very bony, thick full plate, abnormally shaped full plate. And that's interesting because that is the first thing we discover preoperatively when we do middle ear exploration, before seeing the facial nerve. So each time I can see that the stapes superstructure is not connected to the foot plate, then we have to be very careful with the possible abnormal root of the facial nerve. But that's the point. Yeah, so but not so much styloid process or hyoid bone. No. Well, because these structures, uh, many interesting muscles are attached to these structures which are um, involved in swallowing, in mastication, but probably you don't see problems with these functions in the patients. No. Okay, that's clear then. Um, can I go on, uh, yes, Mr. Yep. I have also a question about Chapter 9. Um, it's about the, the MRP, the malleus replacing prosthesis. Um, in the results, on page 173, you write that the transmission um, of the vibration, it, it runs through the contact, direct contact between the tympanic membrane and the prosthesis, and that you don't need any adhesive substances to create this, this uh, contact. Have you tried these substances in the past? Or? Um, I think, uh, to be honest, we need to think about some modification of this uh, malleus prosthesis to improve uh, prosthesis head stability. Because it depends on the anatomy of each patient. But sometimes we have uh, this uh, malleus, the new malleus handle becoming a little bit uh, medialized. And in that case, there's a risk of seeing the, the prosthesis uh, flow, um, moving away a little bit from the uh, malleus handle. So, yeah, my idea would be to increase a little bit the stability by putting some adherence with a metallic ad structure on the malleus handle. Uh, but not uh, not uh, a structure. We could use some uh, connective tissue or vein graft to try to stabilizing it, but I, I don't think it's going to work. I think it's, it's really depending on the modification of the shape of the process itself. I see. And um, I wasn't sure about the, the function of this, this piece of cartilage of tragus that you're kind of interposing between tympanic membrane and the handle. So how does this work? And, and does this one, this, this piece of cartilage have to be uh, fixated? No, in fact, the, the reason why we use cartilage is that the, this process is made in pure titanium. And titanium is not well tolerated by the tympanic membrane when it is in direct contact. So it's mandatory to do cartilage interposition. And I trim it very, uh, very thin, to not to decrease the mobility of the tympanic membrane. But that's the only reason why we have to do it. I see. So thank you very much for this interesting discussion. I'm completely satisfied with your questions. The worth it to the director. I'm sure there will be some other opponents with some spare questions. Thank you very much, Professor Blaise. Well, question from my side. Suppose, based on your results, the European Union gives you a grant of one million euro. 
what research project would you initiate with that? <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, I was not prepared for this question, so I don't know exactly. There are so many possibilities. Well, um, I don't know. I have to think about it really because it's a important decision to take. Um, if you don't decide, you don't get the money. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So maybe moving to the, uh, we still have to improve the passive implant, yeah. but also the connection with the active implants will be also to be debatable and to be a, a good project. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I would like to give the word to Professor Chroman for uh, some questions. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much for the opportunity to ask a question. Dear candidate, um, yes, I have also a question for you, and I would very much like to hear your opinion about this. And I'm, I see quite a bit of similarities with ophthalmology, definitely, and I'm sure also with neurosurgery. The thing is, the, the type of surgery that one needs to do with stable surgery is so precise, and the, the question was already raised a little bit about the skills of the surgeon. But the truth is, if we look from a patient perspective, uh, I definitely would know which surgeon I would choose and which surgeon I would try to avoid. And I think, shouldn't we protect our patients? Because we all know, well, I see a professor overseas moving forward because he's interested. We all know who are the surgeons that should do our ears and which ones we prefer not to do. What, what do you think? Because do you agree with me that, say, staple surgery is a one Possibility surgery, because this, the, 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 the revision surgery has a much lower result. I would like to hear your opinion about that in a few words. words. Yeah, yeah, sure. The revision gives not so, so okay. such a good result. Okay. It moves from, 90, in, my, in my series, from 95% primary to uh, 80 and some, something yeah. revision. So it's completely different. What, wouldn't you agree then, uh, dear candidate, that... Shouldn't we be united and to make sure that our patients do get the best treatment by imposing stronger guidelines of who should do the surgery? I, I strongly agree. But on the other side, we have to train new surgeons. Well, but and in any it, case, uh, they have to stop by, by doing something at what time. So I think it's important that dear, not... Dear, yes, dear candidate, I'd, li I'd like to thank you because the Beagle will enter shortly. Yes, training, of course, training is a separate thing. Uh, but we all see our revision cases, and sometimes you know uh, when they come from a certain region that we can almost predict who was the surgeon. And uh, uh, pr Professor Overseas, can you nod your head if you agree with this? So, uh, I ask the expert, uh, 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 dear candidate, what would you advise the government, or what action should we take to at least do good for our patients, because that's what we need to so that, do. That, that would be the second advice I have to give to my government, which would be very difficult in my country. Um, well, it's very difficult. Eth ethically, it's very difficult to, to say you should not do stapy surgery or you should do stapy surgery. This is, uh, I understand the question, but I would say yes, but I don't know exactly how to do it, because you know, you, you know that kind of things post-operatively only. Uh, so I don't have a clear answer to that, but yes, we, we could go to this direction. But again, coming back to the training, I was not mentioning again only training, but I think it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of dream saying that stapy surgery is a very difficult surgery, very tricky. It's not a very difficult surgery and not so tricky. Any good surgeon to do it. So we have to make a decision who is a good surgeon or a bad surgeon, but that's very difficult. To do it. it may be difficult, but I think it should not be a point, to, uh, point that we should avoid, because I think we all promise to do good for patients. Yes, but uh, difficult to... Yeah, so I, don't, I don't want to avoid that, but I don't know how to make myself the selection for that. It will be very difficult in our country to do it. Well, but can you, because you're the expert, can you think about it on how we should make a, a guideline to optimize patient care? Because I think that's the essence of what we do. We, we started doing it with the European Academy, as you remember, and I was uh, driving these uh, guidelines. But there are so many different points of view inside my country and outside my country. So it was very difficult to go to a final decision on that. But of course, that would be great. In terms of patient selection first, preoperatively, when to operate, minimum elbow gap, things like this, that would be very important. Because as you know, some surgeon would operate at 30 dB elbow gap, which is my position, and some, some now would go for 15 dB, which is too... 
Thank you very much, candidate. I have to go back to the big Ora dean. Hora est, which means time is over. Well, Mr. Candidate, I think you've got ample opportunity to discuss your results, and the committee now will withdraw for further deliberation, and the session is adjourned. <laughs>
Please take your seats again. I hereby reopen the session. Mr. Doctor Kennedy, this committee installed by the Board of Conferral of Doctoral Degrees of Utrecht University has considered your dissertation and has heard your defense. The committee has decided to confer on you the title of doctor. I now kindly ask the supervisor, Professor Groman, to invest you with the honors in the traditional fashion. Gaat u staan? By virtue of the authority conferred by us by law and according to the decision of the board of the confer uh, conferral of doctor degrees present in this session, I hereby confer you, Robert Vincent, the doctor degree to which are attached the rights and obligations towards science and society as laid down by the law and custom. Do you promise always to perform your duties according to the principle of academic integrity, honestly and scrupulously, critically and transparently, and independently and impartially? Yes, I promise. Then I present you with the diploma signed by the rector and supervisors and bearing the great seal of the Utrecht University. Dear Dr. Vincent, Dear Robert, today you have acquired the highest university grade. It takes a lot of work to arrive at the level of PhD, but you've done it. I congratulate you on this big achievement and of course your family and of course the second promoter, Professor Kramers. Your PhD journey here at the University of Utrecht started some nine years ago, if I remember well, something like that. We already did research together and numerous topics when, <coughs> on, no, on numerous topics, when I proposed to you to start working on your PhD title. You did not have to think long and about uh, and quickly agreed to do the project. A couple of times in the, year that in the years that followed, you indicated that you had doubts whether you should continue this ex uh, extensive task and accused me of having tricked you into this. The latter is true. There are, uh, these are strange times uh, we live in now. Even this week, due to COVID-19, we almost had to abandon the ceremony. But here we are, uh, and you've done it. Unfortunately, without some of our friends that are currently unable to come because of the lockdown. Then again, who knows what the world will look like next week, in matter of fact. At this point, I need to thank Professor Kramers, your second promoter, since he gave you the last push to finish the project and to finalize your book. Within the field of middle ear surgery, you have contributed a lot to the sense of surgical treatment and of this type of middle ear disease. You have proven the validity of your techniques with a pristine, precise administration of your patient records in your database and made publications, that made publications possible. It is perhaps difficult to understand for people outside of our specialization, but I'm convinced to say that these data that you presented are unmatched by any other database in the world. They're truly unique because of your, um, your, your, your monarch-like thrive to uh, administrate everything. We've known each other for at least 20 years now, and our friendship has grown as well. 
we shared many scientific meetings over the years and we <coughs> pioneered with telemedicine surgery way back in 2005. And I have to admit, the original idea to unify the, the, uh, the academic world in otology was yours. I can say that we have had uh, <coughs> that we have succeeded with our original idea. As an example, I need to mention our last meeting that we had. We had 3,200 ENT doctors connected to our broadcast from 96 different countries. It's important to realize that all these doctors are in, in theory able to ask live questions to the surgeons and to the uh, moderators of these sessions. We had 24 surgeons operating worldwide uh, contributing to our broadcast. Then the good and the bad. Over this period of 20 years, we both had our ups and downs. That's true. And I'm not going to elaborate too much on the downs we've experienced, but we have had our share. During these moments of darkness, I would say, uh, certainly not uh, many friends seem to remain. This is apparently human nature, uh, as we both have experienced in the past. I came across a person who wrote down his encounter with human nature back in the 1950s of the last century. A true, name, a true hero, his name is Michael. He wrote, in the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And I think that's still true today. Uh, and I think we both can confirm uh, this, but I understand other people present here today as well. This Michael had a tremendous moment of darkness and died at the age of 39. And I'm sure most of you know him better under the name Michael Luther King Jr., a great historical fi uh, figure. I can confirm that you are one of the true friends, uh, one of the two true friends here present today that never kept his silence. I think that, you also <coughs> that this also char characterizes your personality. You are not afraid to stand up and fight for the things that you truly feel are right in your heart. And I thank you for your support you gave uh, <coughs> me during these nightly, hour nightly hours. Robert, going back to the fact that <coughs> you felt tricked by my uh, trick to get you into the PhD. Uh, I forgot to mention also that after you finish your PhD, you also have the obligation to con continue research according to the ethics that we just discussed and you promised. I'm looking forward to our 22nd publication that will follow this year. Our own dreams, just as Michael had them. We've talked many times about who you wanted to invite during your PhD ceremony. Uh, once your book would, uh, would be finished. Your children, luckily here, Roger, Nicole as well, but also your mother, of course, and your friends. Yes, your mother, who will be actually 100 years by the end of this year, and we could not invite her because that would be too dangerous in current times. COVID has changed our plans to some extent, but still we have this ceremony today. Hopefully she's been able to see the broadcast that was broadcast live due to the technical support. And Marion and Romain, it's fantastic that you are here today and able to support your father. Although he's of course French and says he doesn't need support, I know he does. Robert, I'd like to congratulate you again for this great achievement and thank you for being such a great friend. Thank you very much, Professor Grolman. Dear Dr. Vincent, PhD, it's a pleasure, it's an honor uh, for me to address you in this way f as one of the first persons here today. You've done indeed an impressive job. Um, the thesis was very well evaluated. It's based on an enormous period of uh, clinical research, clinical work, where your expertise is without any doubt. And I had the impression that you really enjoyed the defense. It wasn't also too difficult, especially because you were supported by two great parents, your daughter and your son. That's very important. Um, I would like to congratulate you, of course, but not only you, also your family, your friends, and especially Inge Wegner, who has supported you for a lot of things. I would like to thank the technicians for their support. Thank you very much. And I would like the on to thank the online opponents for participating here. We say goodbye to you. 
and uh, well, a very learned sir, on behalf of the Board of Conferral of Dr. Degrees, I congratulate you on the honours which have been bestowed on you, and I hereby conclude the session.